Okay, I think I'll start with the uh, the introduction. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jeff Holstrung, president of the Green Mountain Audubon Society, a chapter of the National Audubon Society covering Franklin, Grand Isle, and Chittenden counties in Vermont. If you receive this Audubon magazine and you live in one of those three counties, you're most likely a member of the Green Mountain Audubon Society. So thank you for, for being a member. Um, if, you, if you're interested in finding out more or joining, I pasted a link in the chat um, to the webpage that gives information on membership. Um, you can get more information and join the chapter if it makes sense to you. Our chapter is based in Northwestern Vermont, a region which has been sacred to indigenous people for thousands of years. The Western Abnaki are the traditional caretakers of these lands and waters. We respect their connection to this region and remember the hardships that they continue to endure. We give thanks for the opportunity to share this place and we commit to helping to protect it. And with that, I will turn it over to our master of ceremonies, Tom Jimicella. Thank you very much, Jeff. So folks, tonight we have a great opportunity. Um, many of you know Emily Filiberti's mother, Julie, who is an avid birder and also on the board of the Friends of Missisquoi. Well, we got the daughter tonight. She is a graduate student at the University of Maine, and many of us know her. We have seen her growing up with her binoculars, and now she's already been tracking bobolinks at Shelburne Farm. She's been tracking red starts in Western Jamaica and observing Lansdale Manic and courtship performances on an island in Panama. Boy, I don't know if she has time to talk about that, but we might. She is finishing up her Master of Science program in Wildlife Fisheries Conservation Biology Department at the University of Maine. Emily is gonna be talking tonight about her research in golden wing warbler research. I'm very happy that thanks to board member Liza Morris, we have lined up uh, four young female scientists and I think it's gonna be a great presentation. So Emily, you are ready, we are ready, take it away. Wow, I already messed it up. Okay, here we go. Um, thanks, Tom, for the introduction. And also, thanks, Green Mountain Audubon, for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, as Tom mentioned, I am a Vermont native, so it's very exciting to be able to present to you guys um, and also just see you folks. Um, so as he mentioned, I am a graduate student at the University of Maine, um, and I've been working for three years uh, tracking the golden wing warbler, um, trying to estimate the annual survival of this pretty um, enigmatic species. Um, and Tom kind of stole my thunder a little bit here, but I will briefly talk about um, my background, um, how I got to where I am today. So as mentioned, um, when I was an undergrad, I accepted a techni technician position uh, working with bobolinks in Shelburne Farms, um, Vermont. So I was working with Noah Perlet, who is an extension of Alan Strong. Um, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this grassland project. Um, basically just went out for three summers and worked with um, fledglings, did some nest searching, banded some individuals, and just absolutely fell in love with field work um, and pretty much decided from that point on that I wanted to continue studying birds. Um, it really struck a chord for me. So I continued um, after I graduated um, from undergrad. I did a stint um, for a summer in 2017 in the White Mountains of New Hampshire where I was doing avian point counts. And that basically just entailed waking up every morning, um, hiking a mountain, and just along the way, um, stopping at certain transects and observing all of the species that I could either see or hear. Um, and then I went overseas. Um, I spent the winter of 2018 in Jamaica, um, where I worked on um, a long-term data uh, project working with American Red Starts, trying to uncovering uncover their overwintering behavior. And then I decided that I wanted to keep skipping out on New England winters. And so in 2019, I um, went to Panama where I was on an isolated island working with lance-tailed mannequins. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, 
This is a species that does courtship displays. So the males cooperatively dance on a perch um, to woo a prospective female. So my job just entailed watching these courtship displays happen and making observations about tiny little behavioral um, things that um, the males and the females did um, during these displays. So I was moving around um, quite a bit and eventually I kind of came to terms that I wanted to settle down and stop moving. Um, it got a little bit stressful just never really knowing where I was gonna end up next. And then I also just kind of wanted to elevate my scientific contribution. I wanted to give more than what I was giving just as a technician on these projects. So I started hunting for um, graduate positions and during my hunt, I came across a golden wing warbler position that my advisor, Amber Roth, was advertising for. Um, and it pretty much just checked all of my boxes. I knew that I wanted to work with small birds just because that's what I had been working with for three years prior, or I guess six years prior. Um, and I also was very keen on staying in New England, um, whether that was in Maine or Vermont. Um, didn't really matter, just wanted to stick around, be close to family. So it was just a pretty serendipitous discovery. Um, I ended up reaching out to Amber and I was offered the position. And so I packed up and I moved to Maine in January of 2021, which I am realizing is exactly three years ago today, which is crazy to think about. But yeah, I was working with Golden Wings. Um, I'm sure many of you on this call are familiar with golden wings. They do um, a small population breeds in Vermont. Um, appearance wise, we have our males um, on the top left and then on the bottom left, we have our females. So the males have this pretty characteristic black throat patch and black eye mask. Um, and the females also have these facial features. They're just gray, um, a little bit duller but both males and females have um, these white facial stripes and they also have golden crowns and of course their um, classic golden wing. Um, in terms of habitat, they're habitat specialists. So they breed exclusively in early successional habitat, um, which are just habitats that are made up of shade intolerant pioneer species. So basically any environment that has gone through some sort of natural or anthropogenic disturbance um, and is experiencing regrowth as a result. So you can find them breeding in regenerating clear cuts, maybe in wet thickets or tamarack bogs, um, anything with um, this early successional growth. In terms of vocalization, um, I'll play a little sound bite of a golden wing. Um, hopefully. I'm not sure if you guys can hear it, but it's a very typical bee buzz, buzz, buzz song. Um, buzzy like some of our other warblers, uh, but not to be confused with a blue wing warbler song. And they nest right on the ground or in grass, or right on or near the ground, usually in grassy openings at the base of stem stemmy vegetation. Um, they have one brood per season, so they only have one nest attempt, and those broods typically have three to six eggs in them. Uh, looking at this range map of golden wings, you can see that they are migratory species. Um, they're considered Nearctic neotropical migrants, meaning they breed in the Northeast or the Midwest, and then they overwinter in either Central or South America. And they also breed into allopatric or completely isolated regions. So we have one population that breeds in the Appalachians and this spans from Tennessee all the way up into Southern New York. And then we also have a population that breeds in the Great Lakes. So from Minnesota all the way over to, I guess, Western Vermont um, and up North into Canada. Obviously, they don't breed in Maine, um, despite me going to school there. So my field work actually took place in northern Wisconsin. That's where I've been going the past three years. Um, Amber Roth, who I mentioned as my advisor, she actually did her PhD work um, with golden wings in that same area. So I'm continuing on uh, with her study population, um, trying to see what I can find with those. But we're here talking about golden wings um, because they're suffering pretty precipitous population decline. And as we know, this is a pattern that we're seeing across the avian community. 
America has seen a widespread 57% population decline from 1970 um, until present day. And you can see this decline is true for the gold wings, which can be found as this poster child um, of the 17% loss in Eastern forested birds. And looking at this breeding bird um, survey population trend graph, which is specific to golden wings, we can see from 1960 until present day, um, they suffered over 70% population decline. And then along with population decline, um, they're also experiencing range contraction. So as I mentioned, they breed in either the Appalachians or the Great Lakes, um, but historically these were not isolated populations. It was um, sympatric or continuous, there was overlap between the two regions. But what's interesting um, about this range of contraction is that these two populations are suffering different rates of decline. So our Appalachian population is losing around 6.3%, um, or they're facing a 6.3% decline per year, whereas the Great Lakes is a little bit more stabilized, but also still declining at a rate of 0.7% per year. So because of this pretty stark decline, they're currently listed as near threatened on the IUCN red list. They're listed as threatened on the Canadian Species at Risk Act. And they're also listed as a species of greatest conservation need on many of the state wildlife action plans um, in the states where they breed. And they're also currently under review for listing on the endangered species list. Um, but before we can list them, we need to um, I guess we need more information about this species. What we really need to do is identify the limiting factor that's driving this stark population decline. Um, so as I mentioned, we're losing over 70% in the past half century. It's actually considered one of the steepest declines of any songbird. And while we're not entirely sure what the primary driver is of decline, we do have some hypotheses. Um, one hypothesized threat is hybridization with the blue winged warbler, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. So in this graph, we have our golden wings on the left, and then we have our blue wings on the right. Um, these two species, they're different species, but they are the same genus. So they're both uh, genus Vermivra, and they're also genetically very similar. I think they have around 99.9% um, of the same genes. Um, and historically, they bred at different elevations and in isolated areas. So there really wasn't any or much overlap between golden wings and blue wings. Um, however, due to climate change, blue wings, um, which are habitat generalists, meaning they're able to live in um, more habitats that are a bit more adaptable than golden wings. The blue wings are now found in current golden wing warbler breeding um, areas, and the golden wings are unable to outcompete the blue wings. So this is resulting in one of two things. Either the golden wings are getting pushed out of these areas, or they're resulting to hybridizing with the blue wing warbler. Um, and hybridization results in two species. On the bottom left, we have a Brewster's warbler, and on the bottom right, we have Lawrence's warbler. These are two of the hybrid species. Um, but what's pretty fascinating about these two species is that they're completely fertile, so they're able to reproduce, um, which is not very typical when you have hybrid species or when you have hybridization. Um, so while this allows Vermivora as a genus to persist, because all of these species are technically the same genus, um, it reduces the rate of productivity for our species-specific golden wing. So that's one hypothesized threat. Another one is collisions. Um, golden wings, for some reason, are known as super colliders. They're in the top five species relative to their population size that suffer mortality um, through collisions. And that's typically um, with large structures uh, like these cell towers. And then another threat is habitat loss, which is true in both their breeding season um, and in their or in their breeding grounds and their wintering grounds. And I'll get into a little bit of that. Um, so as I mentioned, they breed exclusively in early successional habitat, and this habitat was pretty abundant historically, um, but is hard to come by in recent years. And that's due to a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is that there's just a higher conversion of forest to agriculture and other types of human development. Um, with population growth, we have more mouths to feed, we have, um, there's a demand for more homes. 
Um, so we need more agriculture, we need more buildings, we need infrastructure, basically areas that used to support early successional habitat, maybe they were part of timber management. Um, they're now being converted to um, fit human needs. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason is suppression of patch scale disturbances. So early successional habitat, again, occurs when an area goes through some sort of disturbance um, and regenerates as a result. And this could be human related, but it could also be natural. Um, so things like forest fires or beavers or intense floods, Historically, those were all um, natural disturbances that used to create an abundance of early successional habitat. However, recently, um, we've had very intense management and prevention um, of things like wild, wildfires and floods, um, which ultimately leads to less disturbance in vegetation. Hey, Emily, um, we have a question, uh, if I can cut in. We sure. have a question from one of our attendees, and it's about hybridization. The question is, do the warblers care if they are hybridized as long as they can survive? Wow, that's a very interesting question. Um, I guess uh, I will. it's a point of contention or maybe I guess a discussion point among people, whether or not um, we should strive to protect the conspecific golden wing warbler because the genus or the yeah the genus is still surviving um but i think ultimately um there are different perspectives but i guess my perspective is that golden wings have a right to exist as their own species and i guess in terms of the bird's perspective i wouldn't say that they necessarily care um i don't know if there are any if there's research looking at uh, golden wing preference in breeding partners. Um, I think it's just more of who's readily available in terms of who females select. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Thank I, you. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the last reason um, or last yeah, reason that we're losing early sketchable habitat is just overall maturation of forests within significant breeding areas. So areas that used to support early successional habitat have just grown to the point, um, succeeded to the point uh, where they can't support breeding golden wings. So we recognize that the species needs help. Um, and because of this, they're definitely not an understudied species. Um, because of the sharp population decline over the past half century, we've put in a lot of effort to try and understand this species. However, we still don't really know it all. Um, and when uh, US Fish and Wildlife is considering listing a species on the ESL, experts take into account five aspects of the species. So information about their biology, their ecology, their abundance, their population trends, or their threats, or and their threats. And we have a lot of information on all five of these aspects, um, but we are lacking a little bit of information on population trends. So things like survival rates, or immigration rates, or mortality rates. Um, this has just proven to be a pretty big gap in our knowledge of the species. So looking at this basic population model, we know that immigration and reproduction are two factors that increase a population size, and then emigration and mortality are factors that decrease a population size. And if we're looking to identify primary drivers of decline of golden wings, we really need a full understanding of each input and output in this population model. Um, a current gap in our understanding is that of mortality of adults in their population. More specifically, we don't have a lot of information surrounding adult survival. So the likelihood that an individual survives a certain time uh, period and remains in the population. So this is, um, sorry, my cat distracted me. Um, the likelihood that an individual survives a certain time period and remains in the population. Um, and we also don't know variations that exist within survival rates. So how survival might vary annually um, or how survival rates might vary within a season. So within a breeding season or a wintering season. We also don't know about demographic variations. So 
how survival might vary between sex if males have higher survival than females or vice versa. We don't know about age, so um, perhaps there are variations in survival depending on if an individual is an adult or if an individual is a juvenile. Um, and then study specific variations. So if the presence of a tag on an individual might impact survival. And then variations that we can find spatially. So how survival might vary among sites. So how Wisconsin birds are surviving in comparison uh, to Minnesota birds, for example, or regionally. Um, I kept talking about this Appalachian population and the Great Lakes population. We don't know if survival looks the same for those populations. We would assume that survival might be a little bit lower for the Appalachian population, and that's why um, they're experiencing steeper decline, but we're not exactly certain. So this is where um, my research comes in. I was focused on trying to understand annual survival of adults and the variations that could be found within these populations. But most importantly, I was interested in um, variations in survival between sexes. I really wanted to understand if males or females were experiencing um, the same survival annually. But to understand variations in sex, uh, we need to have a proper understanding of both male and female survival rates. Um, and this has historically been pretty difficult to do just because females are very low foragers and dwellers. As I mentioned, they nest right on or near the ground. And because of this, they're just seldom detected in point count surveys. So breeding bird surveys or project specific point counts, any effort to go out to a space and try and observe golden wings, you're likely gonna see males, but you're likely not going to see females. They're just never really seen or heard, um, especially if they're um, nesting or incubated incubating um, uh, or even feeding uh, fledglings. There's also an absence of return recapture rates across most mark recapture studies that are looking at golden wings. So um, when I say return recapture studies, I, I just mean any effort where researchers go out um, with the intention to specifically mark an individual and then attempt to re-encounter that marked individual in the subsequent year. So as you can see in these pictures, and as many of you have probably seen before, if you go out looking for golden wings, males like to perch high and now in the open, allowing us to easily read their color bands um, and know exactly who they are. However, with our low dwelling females, we either never see them or we just can't get a good enough look at their color bands to know who they are um, in these pictures you can see. It's pretty hard with vegetation um, and when they're in the nest to understand what female uh, we're looking at. So we found that traditional color bands as a detection technique is just not enough to ensure repeated detection. Um, we have a lot of mark recapture information about males. Um, we could see the same male year after year after year, um, but females, their survival is just virtually unknown which brings up a lot of questions like, where do the females go? Um, do they return to the same sites? We know that males are very site fidelic, meaning they return to pretty much the same location every year, uh, but we don't know um, what that looks like for females. And then ultimately we don't know how their survival compares to that of males. They're just a very understudied, underrepresented cohort. And typically when you can't actually see the birds to figure out who they are, scientists turn towards using telemetry to follow or track or identify individuals. And these can be seen in many different forms. On the left, we have a bobolink that's wearing a geolocator. These tags um, use light levels to estimate the position of the animal. Um, we also have a woodcock wearing a satellite tag. Um, these tags ping satellites and uploads an animal's location right to your laptop. Um, and then we also have VHF coded tags, which are tags that are actively emitting a frequency that ground receivers or any type of receiving de device can pick up. And these are all tools that we could use um, to try and locate an individual. The problem is, historically, all of these uh, common tags have been impossible to deploy on golden wings, simply because they're just far too heavy for golden wings to carry. 
on average, golden wings weigh nine grams. So you would need an extremely light tag um, to allow or to have the golden wing um, carry it. And in particular, we would need a tag um, that's alive and trackable for over a year so that we could deploy it on an individual um, and then come back the next season, try and track the individual and have that tag um, still actively pinging. So uh, traditionally, um, yeah, we weren't able to use telemetry as a technique. However, there's been a pretty recent exciting shift in uh, telemetry technology that now allows us to potentially collect a lot of data on female survival. So Lowtech, um, which is a tech company, developed a VHF coded nano tag that only weighs 0.43 grams, which is less than 5% of the average golden wing body mass. Um, but what's really important is that these tags last for over 400 days, which is um, long enough to be detected in the subsequent breeding season or in the next year. And what's nice is these tags don't actually need to be recovered to get the data. They're just, I have a graphic, they're just transmitting um, signals that towers and telemetry devices can pick up. So hypothetically, if we were able to deploy these small tags on female golden wing warblers, we might be able um, to uncover some mysteries behind their survival simply because we could go back to the field the next season and not actually get eyes on her, but be able to track her um, through technology and know that she survived a full season. So that was a long winded introduction um, to my actual project, but that's exactly what I did the past three years. Um, my team at UMaine, along with other collaborators, have been using these tags to try and obtain survival estimates for both males and females. So to do this, my study encompassed three different groups. Um, I went out to Wisconsin and I deployed tags on a bunch of females because they are, our, um, are the subject of the study. This is what we were the most interested in seeing. And then we also tagged a bunch of males as well, and that was to understand um, variations in survival between males and females. And then we also had a whole cohort of control males, and these were just males that were color banded but didn't have tags deployed on them. And that was just to see if there were any adverse effects of deploying tags um, or if tags were negatively um, impacting survival of individuals. And in this bottom right graphic, this is just kind of what the tag looks like on the bird. We attached little leg loop harnesses with jewelry cord um, and we just slipped them over both legs so that the tag just sits squarely on their back, um, kind of like they're just wearing a backpack. And I put together a small video um, showing our field practices. I'll just talk over it and explain what's going on. Hopefully it plays well. Um, those are golden wing. So this is a typical study site in Wisconsin. We have our early successional forest. We would go out and we would hear a male golden wing or see a female, and we would find a good spot to put up a mist net. Um, we would put the mist net up, and these are just long volleyball-esque nets that have very fine mesh netting. And we would set up an audio lure that's playing a golden wing song to attract golden wings to fly into the net. Once they do, they fly into the net um, and they fall into a pocket. We safely extract them. After that happens, we immediately took the net down just because we didn't want to catch any bycatch. We weren't interested in anything else. Um, and then we would handle the bird and take measurements. Um, we would assess it to make sure it's okay. And then we would attach a, um, a metal band that has a social security number for birds. Um, each one has an individual number. And we would also attach color bands. Um, each bird got a unique color band combination so that we um, could visually see them through binoculars in the field and know exactly who they were. Next, we would weigh them. Um, and this was to get data on the individuals, but also to make sure they were heavy enough to receive a tag. Um, they had to be uh, less than 5% or the tag had to be less than 5% of their body weight. So we're just putting it in an old film canister, weighing them. This is a traditional way to weigh small songbirds. 
Um, and then we would age it. So we would look at their wing and we would look at their tail patterns and we would see if they were an adult or a juvenile. And then we would collect a tail feather um, for future diagnostics. And then we would take measurements such as wing cord um, or the length of the tarsus just to get in as much data as possible on these individuals. And then we would assess it again, make sure it was still doing okay. And then individuals that weighed enough, we would deploy the nanotags on. So this is me attaching it to both legs, um, making sure it was firmly on and then pushing the feathers underneath the tag to minimize abrasion between the tag and the skin. So this is the final product. <laughs> this is a female golden wing. You can see the tag is just sitting squarely on her back. And you can kind of see um, an antenna that is protruding off of the back of her wings and the back of her tail. Um, and that is what is emitting the, or how it talks to the receivers. Emily, we have a quick question, and that right. is, are you using the MODIS tower system, or do you have your own receivers? That is a great question and leads into this next slide. Um, could not have come at a better time. So once we have our tagged individuals, um, we go back to Maine, we spend the rest of the year over there, and then we returned to the same exact sites um, the next year. And we set out uh, to detect our individuals in a couple of different ways. So the first thing we did, or one of the ways we detected individuals was through ground or air telemetry. So walking around our field sites with a receiver and an antenna, seeing if we could pick up any individuals that way. And then we also had the opportunity to attach antennas um, to a fixed wing aircraft. And we flew transects around our field sites and that was to see if we could pick up anyone that our ground telemetry um, wasn't able to pick up, and also to see if we could pick up any individuals that might have dispersed more than five kilometers away from the original field site. So that was one way. And then we also utilized the MODIS network, which I'll introduce a little bit later, but these are basically just towers that you can um, uh, build near the field sites that are able to pick up the tag um, just as our ground and air telemetry devices could. And then we relied on visual resight as well, um, which was particularly helpful for identifying the control males that might have returned. Um, again, those males didn't have tags, so we couldn't use telemetry, and we relied purely on visually resetting uh, those individuals. And this is just a picture of some of my collaborators. Um, doing uh, ground telemetry. So this inset picture is the receiver that we use. Um, and then you can see my collaborator is holding a blue antenna and he's just walking around trying to see if he can detect any individuals. And then on the right is a picture of um, the H antenna that we put on the plane. And we're flying over one of my field sites in Wisconsin in this picture. And then I mentioned that we also use the MODIS nest network. Um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the MODIS network, um, but it's basically just a, an array of hundreds of towers across um, North and South America, maybe even Europe as well, I'm not sure. Um, all of the towers are able to detect um, pings from my golden wings or our golden wings. And this is a picture of us constructing one of those MODIS stations. Um, near one of my field sites. We're just attaching it to the side of a greenhouse that was in the middle of a potato field. Um, and this is a picture. So every single yellow dot is a MODIS tower that looks exactly or similar to the one that uh, we put on the greenhouse. And every one of those dots, if a golden wing was to fly um, close to those towers, those towers would be able to detect the individual which is really cool because um, we were able to uh, kind of see some of the migratory journeys that some of our individuals took that I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, and then this is just showing the two small towers in Wisconsin that were part of this larger network. But yeah, those two towers in Wisconsin were pretty much right on our field sites and we were able to pick up returning and departing um, and resident golden wings um, at those sites.
through the towers. Um, and then this is just showing the different techniques again. So this is me uh, walking one of the sites with my antenna, trying to see who I could find, scanning the environment. Um, and then this is just some footage of our flight, uh, which I added just because it's so cool. Um, Northern Wisconsin is known for having a lot of lakes, so it was just a very uh, beautiful ride. And we also were able to pick up some individuals that we weren't able to pick up prior. So the flights proved to be successful in detecting our birds, which, which was exciting. So um, I mentioned that I did my field work in Wisconsin, which is this star obviously um, in the Great Lakes uh, portion. And that was in 2021. But then I also had other collaborators who deployed at the same time, deployed the same tags on their population of golden wings. So we had some folks in Tennessee um, that were deploying tags. And then we also had folks in Pen uh, Pennsylvania as well. And this was really neat because we were able to obviously get a bigger, a larger sample size of golden wings, but we were also able to have populations that represented both the Great Lakes and the Appalachian populations. So in all, in 2021, we deployed 82 nano tags. Um, we were pretty successful in deploying tags on males, but females were a little bit trickier, which we had anticipated. Um, we were able to get 20 out on females in the Great Lakes but we fell a little short in the Appalachians. Um, we were only able to get 11 tags out, which was not our target goal. Um, and this is just because golden wings are much harder to locate in the Appalachians um, as opposed to the Great Lakes. So it was just um, almost impossible to even find a female and then be able to capture the female um, and have that female be an appropriate weight to get the nano tag. So, a pretty small sample size and pretty small representation of females in the Appalachians. So then in 2022, which was the next year, um, on top of going back to our field sites in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee to see who we could find from our 2021 cohort, um, we also deployed another batch of tags um, on a 2022 cohort. And we brought on a whole bunch of other collaborators. Um, so on this map, each star is the location where we deployed in both 2021 and 2022. And then the circles are additional collaborators um, that at the same time deployed tags in 2022. So with the extra hands, um, we were able to really boost our female sample size. Um, we were able to deploy 180 tags in 2022 alone. And then you can see female representation was much higher. We got 44 tags out in the Great Lakes and 30 tags out in the Appalachians, um, uh, which yeah, was very exciting. So all in all, 2021 plus 2022, we deployed 252 total tags. Of that, around 100 were females and around 150 were males. Um, and then we were able to get an additional 200 out on control males. And this is just kind of a synopsis of the data we collected. Um, for each bird, we wanted to know what region they were from, whether they were from the Appalachians or the Great Lakes. We wanted to know what sex they were, whether, whether they were male or female. And then we were also curious or made sure that we took note of if they were wearing a tag or not. And then this is just showing the presence of an individual across time. So for example, for bird one, we know that this bird was from the Appalachians. He was a male. He was wearing a tag. We deployed it in 2021. We did not see him in 2022, but in 2023, we were able to see him again. And that's just what those P's represent. And so for all um, 400 of our birds, uh, we were able to get all of this information. And we had pretty interesting um, results. So this is the return rates for the 2021 cohort. Again, that was just Wisconsin, Tennessee, and Pennsylvania. Um, 
we had around 34% returners for control mails, and we had 33% return for tag mails. And this was pretty exciting because um, it was suggesting that deploying tags on individuals was not impacting their return. Um, the control and the tag mails were both having the same relative return rates. Um, however, you can see that only 6% of our females returned, um, only two out of 31 returned, and those two were both from Wisconsin. So none of our Appalachian females um, were re-encountered in 2022. Um, but in 2022, we kind of had different uh, results, and I'm just going to show our results for Wisconsin. Um, but for control males, we boosted it from 34% to 45%. And then um, tag males mirrored the same. We had eight out of 20 tag males return. And these are just uh, some of the birds that did return. I ended up naming all of the birds just because they all had different personalities. And it was easier to remember um, who I was working with if they had an actual name. Um, so those are five of the males that returned. And then we had 35% of our females return, which um, was really neat to see just because um, the previous return rate for females was looking dismal. Um, but yeah, we found eight out of 23 um, tagged females in 2023, so our 2022 cohort. Um, and those are three of the females, cat, lumpfish, and trout. I ended up naming a lot of birds after fish in 2022. And then um, in terms of annual survival, so these are results from my thesis, but I'll try and break it down. We ended up finding that males had um, statistically different uh, survival rates than females. Males, we were looking at survival of around 35%, and females, we were finding survival of around 15%. Um, so there was... Um, Definitely, it definitely represented higher uh, male survival than females. Um, and then looking at this other figure on the right, these were all of the variations that I was interested in seeing. Um, all of, I was interested in seeing if Great Lakes uh, greatly differed from the Appalachians. So if survival in the Appalachians was in fact lower than the Great Lakes, and basically this figure, if it's overlapping the gray lines, it means that there is no variation. We found pretty much the same survival rates in the Appalachians as we did in the Great Lakes, which was pretty interesting um, because we were hypothesizing that individuals in the Appalachians would have lower survival. Um, in terms of site, um, so all of our different dots on the map of collaborators deploying tags, we found no variation in survival among those sites. Um, and we also found no variation in survival between tagged individuals and control individuals, which was exciting and relieving to know that the tags were not adversely impacting um, the success of their return. And so the only, um, variation that we did find was this variation between males and females, again, with the males experiencing higher survival rates uh, than the females. Um, Can I uh, bump in? Uh, we have a question, and it's, uh, is there any information regarding the typical lifespan of gold-wing warblers? Um, I think it's typically like four, four-ish to six, six years. Um, in Tennessee, I ended up going to Tennessee to help some collaborators um, deploy tags there. And we ended up finding a male that I think was in its eighth year. And that was pretty surprising to find in one of um, the oldest golden wings that we had known of. So um, not any more than eight years. Thank you. Um, and then just some other cool results that we found from this study. So I was talking about the MODIS network. We weren't necessarily interested in migratory journeys, but it was cool to see what uh, towers our birds were pinging as they uh, followed their migratory journey or even when they were on their breeding grounds. And this is just a cool example. Um, we had a bird named Bounce City uh, that we deployed a tag on on April 27th, 2021 in Tennessee. 
And we ended up detecting him on a motor station on October 1st of that same year in Columbia. And then what was even cooler is that the same individual returned back to the same um, study site in Tennessee and the MODIS station in Tennessee detected that individual on the same exact day um, a year later. So April 27th, uh, 2022. Um, very cool MODIS detection there. And then this is just um, a figure showing some of the other migratory 2022 fall migratory detections for all of our golden wings that were wearing tags. You can see that a lot of our um, Minnesota uh, individuals and Wisconsin individuals were detected um, in the Yucatan or in Central America. And then some of our Appalachian individuals were detected um, in Panama, but also um, in Venezuela as well. We had one individual, I think he was from Tennessee as well, um, that pinged the only MODA station that existed in Venezuela, which the odds of that happening are extremely um, slim. But yeah, we're not necessarily using this migratory or data in my thesis or for my project, but it's definitely, it shows what information we can get aside from the study objectives that we're using. Um, and some of my lab mates who are also working with Golden Wings are actually using some of this data to try and figure out migratory pathways and what journeys they're taking. So just some applications of my research. Um, with a better idea of survival, we're able to improve our understanding of population decline. Because there was no variation in survival between the Great Lakes and the Appalachians, despite the Appalachians experiencing more popular, or steeper population decline, it might indicate that survival is not a driver of decline. It might be reproductive success. So perhaps Appalachian individuals are facing lower reproductive success than the Great Lakes, and that's why their population is declining as much. Um, or it could be um, individuals in the Great Lakes are dispersing um, further than individuals in the Appalachians. And the, the ones in the Great Lakes are dispersing to the point where we're not able to actually pick them up with uh, telemetry, um, meaning they're still alive, they have survived, we just aren't able to detect that individual. Um, and with that information, um, we can help to inform the ESA review decision. And then we can also um, let other researchers know that the utilization of these nano tags was successful for our project. Um, it was successful in answering some of our study objectives um, and it didn't prove to harm the bird in a way um, um, that other researchers could uh, use these tags to answer their own study questions. So it untaps a multitude of research opportunities for other species that might be in need. Well, now we have two questions. You are just stimulating the chat like crazy. Okay. So the first one is, how successful are golden wing warblers in recruitment of young into the adult population? Um, They're pretty successful. There are a lot of studies that look at juveniles. Um, and in fact, one of my lab mates is looking at survival um, for fledglings after um, the parents are done feeding them. So the parents will continue feeding them after um, they fledged, but then they reach a point where they're on their own. So my lab mate is looking at survival um, at that point forward into migration. Um, and I, I don't think that, I don't know too much about their productivity, but I don't think it's different than any other um, or most other ground nesters where they do face a lot of predation through nest or through uh, ground predators. Um, but I'm, yeah, I think recruitment is all right. Um, all of the, the second part, you, you're, you're hitting two questions that have just popped up. So thank you for answering the ground predation part of the third question. The second one is, can these offspring replace lost adults to any great degree? Um, can they replace adults? I, I guess what I think the question means, you know, the the adults that that um do not survive, uh, can those young uh goldwing warblers 
can these offspring replace them and take their place? Okay, yes. Um, we have noticed, we have documentation of that happening. Um, older males are very territorial and they're very loyal to their territory. Um, but once that male either passes away or it just doesn't return to that site, um, younger males will come in and they'll claim that territory as their own. So there is a constant cycle um, if the habitat is still viable of golden wings coming in and replacing um, older males, if that was the question. That was. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm just about done, but I guess I just wanted to finish with a pretty cool story um, that came out of this research that had nothing to do with golden wings, um, but was very special to me. Um, so one of the two MODA stations that we built to detect golden wings, um, on the left, this was our other tower, so not the one on the potato farm. This one was in an experimental forest that was owned by the state, um, and we just attached it to the top of a random utility pole. Um, one of our stations um, picked up a red star that was wearing a nano tag that was very similar to the ones that my golden wings were deploying. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool just because I was able to go on the MODIS website and look up where that red star was from. And it ended up being from um, Font Hill uh, Preserve, which is the same place that um, I went to in Jamaica when I was studying red starts. So my station was able to pick up um, a female that came all the way from Jamaica. Um, it was probably tagged on a site that I had walked hundreds of times um, and it had flown all the way up to Wisconsin, um, which was just cool in itself. And then I started to notice, I would check the MODIS website every day uh, and to see what our towers were picking up because I wanted to see if they were picking up any golden wings. Um, but I noticed that this Red Star was continuing to ping the station. So I first thought that it was just passing through um, and that it was just a one hit wonder. It was cool that we detected it. Um, but then once it started to consistently ping day after day, I kind of got the sense that this Red Star was sticking around and we had found its breeding uh, location. So I reached out to my collaborator or my friend in Jamaica who used to be my old supervisor he was the one who was still actively deploying tags. And I told him that I was pretty sure that one of his red starts was breeding um, near my field sites in Wisconsin. And so we chatted about it. We got really excited. I ended up going out with my ground receiver and trying to, uh, I tried to track down the individual. Um, he told me that it was a female that he had tagged this year. I think it was like three months prior he had tagged her or I don't, I'm not sure when, but it was pretty, it was in within that year. Um, and so I went out with my ground telemetry and then I was able to figure out just about where this female red star was. It was on private property. I ended up finding out who owned the private property. I got permission to walk on their land and I tracked this female red star all the way to her nest. Um, and this is a picture the bottom right um, is her on the nest. You can't see the tag, but she definitely had a tag and it was emitting the same frequency that my golden wings um, were emitting. So it was kind of this like full circle moment that I had traveled, I, in some way I had traveled the same path that this female red star had traveled um, coming from our time in Jamaica and moving up in the world um, onto bigger and better things in Wisconsin. Um, but this was just an incredibly cool story because it's super rare to know the exact location where an individual is overwintering and where an individual is breeding. Um, it's known in some larger bodied birds um, and for birds that have very restricted ranges like uh, Kirtland's warblers. Um, but this was definitely the first scenario where we knew exactly where a red start of a warbler um, was both overwintering and breeding. Um, so just a very cool story. And my friend ended up typing um, a manuscript for that. And so we're gonna hopefully get that published um, and share with the world this cool discovery. 
So we have another question. Thank you. This is fascinating. Um, it's he says, um, how do you get to the root cause of lower female survival rates when they spend a lot of time of the year far south? Another question, do you have collaborators on the females wintering grounds? Um, so wait, I'm sorry, what was the first question again? First, sorry about that. How do you get to the root cause of the lower female survival rates? when they spend a lot of the time uh, in the in the neotropics? Yeah, so females and males spend the same amount of time in the, in the tropics overwintering. Um, and to answer the second question, we do have people, researchers uh, collecting data on golden wings in Central America. I'm not sure that we have anyone in South America that's viewing um, the Appalachian population, um, but we do have people in the Great Lakes that are looking at both males and females. Again, females are pretty hard to find, so they have a lot more data on males. Um, excuse me, but they do have enough information to know um, that males are hanging out in better quality habitat um, on the overwintering grounds and females are kind of pushed um, to lower grade quality habitat. Um, excuse me, sorry. Um, and I will, I will stress that, um, despite having, uh, female representation, probably the best female representation we've had on golden wing studies, um, it was still a low sample size and the nature of getting survival estimates, we're not able to piece apart, um, if an individual has suffered a mortality or if an individual has just um, immigrated out of the system. And so we're not able, they're still alive, but we're not able to detect it. So it's very possible that females might just be dispersing um, quite a bit more than males. Um, we did try to account for that by doing the aerial surveys, but um, again, the nature of the model, we're not able to, um, discern uh, mortalities from dispersal events. So it's an apparent survival estimate as opposed to a true survival estimate. So there are different reasons why we could have found lower female survival. Um, and some of some of the data that I collected will go into a much more complicated mo integrated population model that I don't know much about. Um, but from that, uh, they're able to better piece apart um, the confounding mortality and dispersal events. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'll just finish by acknowledging um, all of my collaborators throughout 2021 and 22, 2021, 2022, um, all of my field techs that have helped me throughout the past three years, my advisor, um, everyone who's helped me with statistics, um, and then all of my funding and support. This project was largely supported by US Fish and Wildlife um, and also the University of Maine and Knobloch Family Foundation. And that's all I got. So we don't have any more questions following yet, but uh, uh, there I'm sure there might be some. I have a question for you. First of all, congratulations on giving us a splendid and very specific presentation. I think it's fascinating. And I'm so proud of you as being a product of Vermont that you are <laughs> on your journey. So my question is, where do you see your journey going in the next two to five years? And what are your goals? Um, yeah, that's a that's the question of the hour from a lot of my <laughs> family and friends. Um, I, at this point, I'm pretty sure I don't want to continue on to get a PhD. Um, so I've been applying to, or I'm interested in working for state agencies or NGOs and continuing to do research, um, but also kind of getting my hands behind the political aspect, um, understanding like exactly what goes into listing a species now that I've collected all of this data and I've come up with these questions and I've learned how to analyze data and address the questions, I am interested in having a bigger stake in the process of further protecting species. So yeah, hopefully working for an NGO, um, VCE will forever be my dream goal, my dream job. So I'm just crossing my fingers that they need a biologist soon. Um, 
Yeah. Well, we wish you the best of luck. And we thank you, Emily Filiberti, for sharing your research with us and sharing your insights on a species that we all here love to find in Vermont. So again, uh, thank you very much for giving the third talk. And for everybody else, you can find out our next event is on the Green Mountain Audubon uh, website and you can see it under events. And uh, I have a funny feeling, uh, Emily Filiberti, that we might be asking you to present in a year or two, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. So if those of you who uh, joined us tonight would like to make a small donation, we would certainly appreciate it. We earmark those for educational opportunities for underserved youth, in particular, the summer camps of Audubon, Vermont. Uh, Jeff has just posted into the chat. We have a link for membership and donations. Having said that, um, I'm going to wish you all a good evening. If anybody was not able to attend the event tonight, we have recorded this. And within a day or so, it'll be on the YouTube channel where we uh, put them. And you can find that link again on the Green Mountain Audubon site. So, Emily... Hats off to you and uh, fly away and do what you're going to do. And we thank you. Oh, and a little present will be coming your way. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me. It was great to, to meet with all of you and yeah, just talk about my research. It's very exciting. Thank you. And good evening, everybody. Away we go. Good night. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Tom. Good night, everyone. Night.